Hello, everyone. Here we are. Now, this time is different. We are recording in English, and you know, unless Anastasia and Paul learn Spanish, that probably they are close, but it's not just the time. So, we are here with them. Paul McDade is the uh, CEO of Aventra, and also Anastasia, that is the CFO. So, we have been uh, doing some videos with them before when the company was kind of kicking off and doing the first acquisitions. Uh, so, now we are here that we closed already. It took time, but finally happened. Uh, the three acquisitions that they did in Angola for the same blog. So I think it's a, an interesting time to be here speaking with them and let's see what they can tell us. So first of all, how are you doing? All good. Yeah, it's, uh, it's summer. Sun's almost shining here in London, but not quite. Well, some people told me that it's kind of summer in London, right? <laughs> It is summer in London. It just doesn't always mean that the sun's shining, right? <laughs> it's British summer, so... It's pretty summer, it right? Sure. Let's start. So the first question for Paul. So I, I would like to try to understand, it's been some time since you started in Aventra. Now you have that kind of recurrent cash flow. You have the three assets or the three acquisitions on the same asset. Like how different is, it is? like the things compared to, to the time that you started in Aventra and you were looking for deals? Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's almost three years since we rebranded Sterling Energy to Aventra. It was May 2021, so it's just, just over three years. I think at the beginning, um, you know, when you're starting something new, there's no, no certainty whatsoever. Um, so a lot of the focus was getting the brand out there. Um, it was about really trying to introduce the company to uh, all the stakeholders. So regionally, the governments, making sure they recognize who the team were, the capital markets, and of course, our industrial partners who are the people we're trying to buy some assets from. So I think a lot of it was company set up and, and getting out there, getting the brand out there. Uh, and then getting introduced to deals and starting to look at deals. So that, that was a lot of other things going on, but that, that was probably the core of what we're doing. You know, you jump three years forward with the deals done. I think uh, it feels more established. There's more, much more stability. You talk about cash flow production reserves. Um, and I think in terms of focus, uh, it's now a balance between we have an asset. I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about it that has huge potential. So some of the focus has to be on that asset and, and have the growth story around the asset successful. Uh, and that needs to be balanced off against continuing to look for deals and, and be in the market and uh, get the intelligence about what's going on. So I, I'd say now it's a balance between kind of growing the asset and looking for deals. And then obviously, for, particularly from Anastasia's side, we, we have a company to run. It's got cash coming in and cash going out. And there's all the usual usual items for a, for a live uh, operational company. Let's focus now a bit on Angola, okay? Because when you started with Aventra, and I can tell you that because I'm an investor myself since the beginning, actually, before you had any kind of assets, you were focusing on West Africa in general. <laughs> like there are different countries that you were interested uh, in. And you did your first deal in Angola, but also your second and your third deal there. So what I would like to understand, Paul, is like, what do you like so much uh, about Angola or how is, why is that interesting for, for you? Yeah, I, I, th I think when you stand back from Africa and you say we're focused on Africa and we're focused then on production assets and, yeah. and to a certain extent, kind of midlife mature production assets that drives you away from East Africa over to West Africa. So, so by default, we were going to look more at West Africa. Um, then when you consider West Africa, there, there is um, got to be a focus on Nigeria, Angola, because they're the big markets in West Africa. I mean, if, if you were to kind of sum up production in West Africa, you know, the majority of that production comes from a combination of Angola and Nigeria. Uh, and then you have all the other company, uh, countries sorry, contributing to the, the rest. Um, so therefore, Angola is always going to be a kind of one of the key markets for us. Um, I think what's been really interesting, 
I, you know, myself and Anastasia were involved in Angola in the past, but coming back to Angola as a Fentra, I mean, obviously we are, we are new, we're a new company, but actually Angola has changed so much in the last six, seven, eight years. Um, eight years or nine years ago, it would not have been the place to go and start a small oil and gas company. Uh, whereas today, I think we've been very fortunate on our timing and kind of, what, well, why, why do we think that? Well, you know, Angola has abundant resources, huge, I mean, probably 15 billion barrels are thereabouts of uh, resources, oil and gas resources, which have been found and have been yet to be produced. So that's physically there. Um, it's, a, it's dominated by the IOCs. 95% of those resources are held by either the IOCs, the major oil and gas companies, or Sonigo. Right? So there's a concentration with big companies. Uh, and those big companies will, and not have to, but they will divest those assets. Um, so the concentration is a positive for the moment, but that, that will change. And then I think one of the important things is we found Angola a stage of change in itself. Uh, there's a change of governance because ANPG have been formed back six, seven years ago, which has really tidied up in the governance of the oil and gas industry in Angola. Um, they have been given the mandate to incentivize investment. So what you find now is an Angola that's not, not it was always seen to be a high tech, high tax country. Uh, now you have a country where ANPG are leading the charge to say, we need to be competitive. If we want people to invest in the oil and gas industry, we need to be competitive. So you have this combination of a lot of resources, a competitive investment environment and an attractive investment environment, and this concentration of the IOCs. And you put those three things together, I think there's a, there's a long road ahead in terms of deals and opportunities for companies of the size of, of, of Entra. Yeah, and, and to be fair, in Angola, I have seen something that probably I didn't see in the last 15 to 20 years in developed countries. That is like taxes actually going down instead of going up, you know. So we, we had the example of the North Sea that I know that you put it as an example, you know, in terms of transition yeah. and, and it is. But when you see what is happening mainly in UK, but also in other jurisdictions in the North Sea in terms of taxes, uh, it's incredible how bad it's been for like the companies that are trying to do business there. And on the contrary, what you have found in Angola is that actually taxes are getting better, at least in, in the block that, that you have, right? Yeah, and, and if you go back, I mean, I was involved in the North Sea in the late 90s and early 2000s. If you go back to that time, the North Sea was an attractive place to invest. Probably for most of the reasons I just said, you had a concentration of IOCs, you had a very large resource base. And at that time, you actually had a government that was supporting investment and attracting investment and encouraging investment. It's just, you know, basically what you find today is that the UK North Sea and Angola are at different bookends. So, you know, they're different ends of the scale. I mean, I would almost argue one is potentially uninvestable, uh, whereas the other one is actually trying to really turn the corner and become a very attractive investment environment. And, you know, we're, we're we lucky to land in Angola at the right time? Do you make your own luck? But it's, it's great to be there at, at this particular time. Uh, and I think, you know, we can look forward to the next five to 10 years to be similar, I believe. Yeah, I, I, I agree when you say, uh, I don't know if, I would say uninvestable, uh, not C because everything has a price, right? But sure. uh, that the assets value are almost zero. I can tell you that, you know, so I, I think that I, I'd be surprised if people is selling some assets for free or even like paying money to get out, you know, and do not pay the, the commissioning cost. So, uh, and before we continue, Anastasia, I don't know if in your experience in other companies that you have been working in different jurisdictions, you have had this kind of experience on countries that the taxes are going down. So things are actually getting better in a way. Look, I think you look at what's been happening, not just in Angola, but also in other countries in Africa. That's the theme, right? You may or may not have the same identical experience as what we're seeing in Angola. 
But obviously, it's such a big component of not just, you know, a small group of people, but it's, it has far greater implications for the country as a whole. And they, they look at it from a holistic perspective. They want to create jobs, they want to create prosperity, they want to continue to bring Angolans up. And the oil industry provides a lot of growth behind not just, again, a very small group of individuals, but a broader economy. And that's why it's so important. I mean, the interesting uh, kind of aspect of tax, and we'll come to talk about our assets later on, but the UK tax, we understand, is nearing 80%. You know, I don't know exactly what that is, but it's that order of magnitude. Yeah. Our tax rate, effective tax rate in Angola right now is 20 Right? This is everything. So it includes all the bits and pieces, all the complexities of a production sharing contract. In the end, it's 20%. And it will be at that same level. As long as we continue to reinvest in the asset, it will be 20%. So you pick and choose which and jurisdiction think, would you rather do business and, with. And I think what, what Anastasia describes there well is if you go back to the very first slide pack, that maybe you looked at when we launched the Fentra in May 2021, we had key principles. And what the key, the key principles described, because that's why we called the company a Fentra African Energy Transition, was really a just transition. And it was about this balance of these economies are reliant upon oil and gas and resources. And therefore they need to balance off producing those resources in a smart way and in a, in, a, in a cleaner way, but they can't just stop producing them because then you'll have a massive social consequence. And really at that time, and if you look back at these five or six key principles, they were kind of describing that just transition, which I think has actually played out pretty much as we stated it would do back in 2021. Okay, and before we move into organic growth, uh, you were speaking before, Paul, about like the reasons to be in Angola, but what, what I would like to understand is also like, what are the things that you feel that Angola as a country, and I'm speaking about Son Angola, the regulator, the government, do like about the Fentra? Because definitely there has been a lot of trust, I believe, in your, in your company. So what are the things that for them are quite kind of interesting or useful for you to go there and it's like okay i think a venture can do a, a good job for example yeah i i think there's a little bit of kind of there's a bit of history before a venture as well you know we we myself and anesthesia all have a kind of common history um prior to a and and we were known um in the region prior to this so we came or well, a venture as an entity didn't have a reputation but the individuals within that entity had a reputation. And I think that was the initial attraction uh, to both ENPG and Sonegal as we started to look at coming into this asset. We, we came, I think, with a very positive reputation around a number of things. One, technical capacity. You know, we, we had historically done some really interesting things uh, in Ghana, Uganda, Kenya, and elsewhere in, in West and East Africa. Um, I think we had always focused on ESG in the past, but you know the environmental part was more an operating environment rather than climate historically. But yeah. social and governance, we were very, we had a very strong reputation for basically local content, nationalisation, localization of our workforce and our leadership, um, and then good governance. So I, I think we brought some reputation with us, which EMPG and Sonigal knew and liked. And really, as they start to grow their, let's say, small cap to mid cap environment, I think they saw us as a good, solid foundation uh, to that piece from, from a values point of, not a financial value, but from a values point of view. So I think that was one thing. Um, and then I, th I think what we've seen, so that's kind of what we bring to the party. I think what, what we've seen in Angola is back to ANPG, uh, an agency, a regulator who you can deal with, very competent and, and people across the table you can negotiate with. You know, it's not, it's not always easy to negotiate, but they're, they're obviously trying to protect the country's interests and make sure they're maximizing kind of commercially the position of the country. 
but they're open-minded to negotiate and they understand that we have investors and we need to demonstrate to investors that it's worthwhile investing in Angola. Um, and then on the Sonegal side, you know, what's been really great is in terms of the the partnership working with Sonegal, I think Sonegal PMP who are the operating arm of Sonegal, who we work with on a day-to-day -day basis, have been really very open to ideas we brought to the table. So I think they've welcomed ideas we're bringing and our, our team's working closely. We'll talk more about that as we go through the discussion. But th those are some of the areas, um, and, you know, and, and it, back to this point we made before about the competitive environment. This is a very investable environment we, we consider. Right. And, and I also guess that you have had also an open-minded in terms of trying to help them to progress at all levels. I'm speaking about Son Angola, I'm speaking about the regulator there and the, the whole country as such. And, and I guess an example of that, it was like the third deal that you did, right? Like it was a kind of combination, like you were acquiring part of the asset, but also you were like giving a bit to uh, Son Angola. So I don't know if you can tell something about it, but for me, it was kind of example of that you are collaborating instead of like fighting or, or competing. Yeah. You know? I, and, and I think, you know, one thing we've been successful with in, in this company and previous is that, you know, there needs to be a win-win and there needs to be a balance and everybody needs to walk away from the table kind of a little bit feeling they've given a bit away, but they've also received, right? It's, yeah. And that, I think that's a much more durable model than you trying to grab as much as you possibly can on day one, right? It's yeah. a much more durable model. And, and the example you gave was, you know, we were overly successful when we went out and tried to acquire more and more equity in Block 305 to the extent that if we had forced through the completion of all the deals we've done, we would end up as a bigger equity holder than Sonigo. And that was really never our intent. I mean, Sonigo is a national company, they're the operator. And really, when we realized that that was going to be the outcome, we just went in and had a conversation with Sonigo to see what worked with them. And, and what you saw in July of last year was we changed the Sonigo deal to really get that balance right. And, and I think, to be honest, I think it was the right thing to do. Um, right. I think our maybe some investors thought, well, we could have had 36%. Why did you not stick with it? But I think what all investors are seeing already and we'll see more and more in Angola and Afentra is that those sort of decisions where you try and strike a balance, kind of they, 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 they maybe, you maybe appear to lose a little bit in the short term, but you'll gain a lot more in the longer term. And, and that's right. all been our model. It's always been our model of how we work in Afentra and previously. Look at the long term and think about all the parties and if everybody can win, then it's a much more durable relationship. Yeah, I completely agree. I, I guess that if you look at strictly the short term, what's going to happen with the surprise up and down in three months, whatever, you you prefer to have like 2-3% more of the asset or, or whatever it is. But like when you have idea of, well, we want to be here 5, 10, 15, 20 years in Angola, definitely having a good relationship with Son Angola is key, mm. to be fair. So it's something that it depends on the kind of also that shareholders, to be honest. You know? Yeah. Um, and, and to be honest, uh, it, it, it's kind of, it feels quite an obvious thing to me, but what's quite surprising, and I, I think that would be the same for Anastasia and Ian and the team, I think what's quite surprising is these simple concepts are not necessarily obvious to everyone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the problem is that the, there is people that there are shareholders today that they are telling you what to do, but they are not going to be there in six months, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the way I see it is like, those are not the ones that you should be listening, you know, but that's mm. it's something that I'm saying. I don't need any quote here. Okay. Yeah. So uh, let's move into organic growth. Okay. So in terms of organic growth, now you own these assets that they're really good assets. So what we would like to understand is like, what is the potential of the assets that you have acquired and what is the work program that you are planning together with the joint venture partners, basically? Yeah. So really, you know, you saw recently we went, we came out with the webinar and uh, the presentation, I think the 11th of June, we came out with that. And one of the key purposes of that presentation having now completed the deals, was to try and give a bit more colour 
to the real excitement we have around the asset and the potential of the asset. So, you know, what, what's great about 305 and 305A is it contains a huge amount of oil. I mean, uh, in between the two blocks, there's an excess of three and a half billion barrels in place. And, and whilst the previous developers, Total in the past, and Sonegal have done a good job of operating it, there's still an awful lot of that resource still to be extracted from the ground. Um, and we came out, you know, in the, that presentation saying that, you know, while, while we have, a, I think, 108 gross, our share is 30 percent of uh, 2P reserves, we think that number can double, maybe even more than double over time as we develop the asset and invest in the asset. Um, you, you saw 2023 is really the first year we've been involved in the asset properly as a partner, an active partner. Um, and we've seen, you know, working in a collaborative way with M&P, our partner, and Sonegal, our operator, we've seen production go from 17,500 barrels a day to 23. You know, so that, that's proof that if you start getting the work right, the basics right, you can increase production. Um, and we can see that going from strength to strength. You know, we, we the, the information we put out in our presentation, you know, yeah. is a combination of infill drilling, development of 305A, workovers, ESPs, uh, good oil field management, uptime. You put all that together and we think there's no reason why this asset can't do 30,000 barrels a day over and may even get to 40,000 barrels a day, you know, just depending on the pace of investment. So there's, there's enormous potential of upside uh, across 305 and 305A. So that, that's the organic story, right? There's a lot to do in this asset. If, if you think about it, it's kind of crazy that you bought an asset, like some chunks of an asset, three times, and the asset was doing like 17,000 barrels. And you are telling me, no, this can almost double. So it's like you were buying the asset at a price that it was, for me, a really good price. When it was doing 17,000 barrels, of course, if this is doing in some years 30,000 barrels, the value of the asset is huge, is way more. So, hats off is all I can say at that point for that. And, and my question, and now it's a question, is like, do you believe that the low hanging fruit is already done in terms of like those kind of increases in the number of barrels per day? that the capex, the amount of money that you need to invest is, is very low? No, I don't think so. You know, I, I, I think, um, you know, the, the we call them light well interventions. It's really yeah. cleaning the wells. You're putting acid in the wells, you're cleaning the wells, making them a little bit more efficient. The, the other thing I'd say um, is that this is, a, this is not a single oil field. One of the other things we loved about it, it's not a single oil field with a couple of wells. It's a whole portfolio. It's yeah. nine oil fields, it's 160 wells, it's 17 platforms. There's a whole portfolio here. And the nice thing about portfolio is like we do these LWIs, you know, one LWI gives you an extra 100 to 150 barrels a day. It's not much, right? The good news is we've done 30 of them last year. So you, you multiply that by 30 and then the, the number gets more interesting and much more material. And the same is true this year. You know, our plan this year is to try and do up to 45 of these interventions this year. And these are very low cost. Water right. injection, no, nobody ever talks about water injection because it's not, not very interesting, right? People want to talk about oil production. Not sexy, right? <laughs> not sexy. But, you know, last year we got it to 33. We think we can double it this year. The more you pump water on the ground, the pressure increases and the more oil and liquid will come out the production wells. It's kind of that simple. And all the equipment's there. It's really about spending a bit of money as we're doing at the moment, refurbishing it and getting it more reliable, the power system, so that the pumping of water into the ground is really reliable. And we, you know, if we can get the water on the ground up to 150,000 barrels a day, the pumping, the injection, that will have another positive impact on um, production. It's kind of one of the key components. So there's these easy things to do before we really have to start even thinking about bringing rigs to do workovers or infill drilling or development activities. Okay, and to close here with this kind of part of the organic growth, this one is for Anastasia, is like, there will be a part of the of the plan that you presented like last month 
that it will be about infiltrating, there will be more capex that you need to spend in order to get those kind of 30K, you know, that is the kind of aspiration. So are you concerned about the amount of capex that you need to spend to get there? So as, as Paul said, we work very collaboratively with the operator, but also the other uh, joint venture partners. Um, and there is a balance, right? There's a balance between how much cash flow the JV would like to see annually, including Sonangol, including ourselves. And how much of it do we really think is the sensible thing to do on at each period of time? And it's also how much is feasible, how much is it that we can reliably say will be deliverable within the certain time frame, within the certain budget. I think what you're trying to do is get into this positive spiral because at the moment we're investing and we're still delivering cash flow. Yeah. That, if it's that not that we are investing but not getting cash flow today, but I will get it in the future. Is that I'm yeah. investing while getting the cash flow to get more cash flow. Yeah. And, and the thing is, is you as that investment takes effect, the actual total revenue goes up. So there's now more cash available. So, you, you know, so if, if you divide it, you can afford to spend a bit more on investment and you still got a bit more left to take as free cash flow. And if that investment carries on, you know, then this cat, the whole revenue increases. So, you know, the, there's a much higher revenue level at 30,000 barrels a day than there is at 20,000 barrels a day. Right. So it's about getting into this positive spiral of investment delivering more and then therefore being able to invest more, but not negatively impact, as uh, Anastasia says, your, your cash flow, actually, maybe even positively impact your cash flow. And Alex, I think one of the key differences here um, relative to the royalty regimes, um, you get 75% back when you invest so it's it's a very efficient system so if the system is designed to encourage people to invest and that's one of the again attributes of, and why we're faced with 20 percent tax in the end is because the system actually encourages you to go and spend more and then you get more and that that spiral continues positive spiral well 75 percent rebates don't tell the labor party is all, all i can tell you so mm -hmm. With that, we will move into the onshore because your assets are offshore in Angola, but also you have been bidding for some onshore assets in, in the country, within the country. And actually, you have been selected as the preferred uh, bidder for 45% of non operating uh, equity in both the CON 15 and the CON 19. So basically, we would like to understand better what are your expectations on those uh, onshore licenses. Yeah, the, the onshore in Angola, that part of the onshore, the Kwanzaa Basin, is interesting. You know, th this area is large, um, was producing oil and gas back in the 60s and 70s. So there's a, there's a working hydrocarbon system. There are developed oil fields within this onshore basin. Um, but what happened, obviously, in Angola is you had the civil war, the civil unrest, in the 80s and 90s so all that activity stopped and by the time you know things settled in angola and and it was then a, a safe working environment everyone was offshore you know co5 had been developed they were starting just to get into the deep water and you're finding big mega fields out so no one's interested to go back and look at the onshore so that that's the little history of why is this basin sitting here pretty much undeveloped and unexploited and underexplored. Um, so one of the things the MPG has been tasked with is obviously overall task is increased national production, which they are doing successfully offshore. But part of it is, well, why don't we try and reinvigorate the onshore and see if we can increase production from the onshore? So that that's why they've run a couple of license rounds. Clearly, the onshore is not material in size in terms of the IOCs. This is not an area where Exxon or Total or you know are going to be interested. It's not of the scale that matches uh, those companies. Um, but so what you have is it needs to be smaller companies. But at the moment, the smaller companies that exist in Angola are quite limited. Um, so really, AMPG were quite encouraging towards us to look at the onshore and get involved. 
Um, so that that's where we they had the bid round last year. We listened to what they were saying. We went and had a look and and saw the significant potential there. So we we bid uh, and we the status today is that in Con 19 we've already pretty much agreed the license and we're we're just waiting on the approval process. Uh, on on Con 15 we're just in that process of finalising the license agreement. Um, at, with the MPG and then it will go forward for approval. Um, so it's very much the, the activity of securing those licenses is, is moving forward. Um, when we should have news, public news, when we are going to get an RNS saying something about those licenses? Um, I would expect, where are we now? I mean, I, I, I think it, there's a reasonable chance in the third quarter we would be coming out to say that these licenses have been approved and, and we're now starting kind of to progress work programs on, on the licenses. We're already thinking about those work programs at the moment with the, the operators. Um, so that, that would be. And, and I think what's really interesting about the CON 15 and 19, those, those two licenses, um, have wells in them that show that there's a working hydrocarbon system, but they haven't benefited. If you think the last time they were really looked at was probably at, at, at the latest, maybe in the 80s, right? A lot has moved on in our industry in right. terms of the technical tools we have to assess licenses. We, we historically, mean particularly, had a lot of experience onshore in East Africa. Uh, where we made big discoveries up in Uganda and Kenya. Um, and we use some technologies like FTG. So FTG is a full tensor gradiometry survey where you use an aeroplane, you fly across the block, and it gives you a very good view of a large area and allows you to then position 2D seismic very efficiently. So we bring a lot of experience um, to apply these new technologies into these license areas. And the costs are really very modest, you know, our expenditures on these. To work out how much potential there is, is going to be quite a low cost activity over the next couple of years. It, it could happen the same thing that it happened on the current blog that you are, that the expectations are here, and then the reality is that with some work, it is actually more? Well, I, I, I think we're, I mean, what excites us about the onshore is the unset, I mean, it's not like you're going into an exploration block that you don't even know if there's hydrocarbons or there's a working system. You know that is there. You know there's something there, right? The question is, whatever is there, is it really, is it material, right? And if you go and look at, and, and again, we're going to be doing some work and looking at it, and we'll, we'll, when we announce the blocks, we'll come out and give a lot more detail and colour at the time. But, you know, if you go to neighbouring countries, you know, go to Gabon, and look at the scale of onshore and the fields and the production from onshore Gabon, or go and look at Congo Brazzaville and look at the production and the fields that have been, we, we used to be involved in a big field down there called Mabundi. I mean, we look at that and we think, you know, is that analogous with onshore Kwanzaa Basin? Could you find these material fields in the onshore Kwanzaa Basin? And the answer is we don't know. And I guess that's what's exciting, right? And and what's even more exciting is that we think to work out whether they're there or they're not there is actually going to be quite a low cost exercise. So very easy to do from the kind of cash flow we're generating uh, in the company. And, and just, just to close on, the, on this topic, how long does it take since they tell you, okay, all the signatures are here, everything is agreed, you can start working there until you get the first oil? How long does it take more or less? I really, in in the case of these blocks, it, it, it depends, right? I mean, we, we got to go through and do the surveys. The, the So you're really looking, at, you know, to decide to drill a well, to go and make a discovery. I think you're looking at 24 months at least before you would drill a well, maybe longer, right? But if you were really optimistic, you I don't think you'd be drilling a well for the next 24 months, that, that sort of level, the, the, you know, but... Um, maybe within two to three years you could be drilling that that's the sort of timeline which is good and bad right i mean obviously people would love it to be a lot quicker um, always things take time right you need to do the work first you need to do the analysis um but again from a company of our size we're we're building up potential 
and the cost of building up that potential is very low. And for sure, when we come to the point of drilling, we're, we're going to be a bigger, stronger company with much bigger cash flows. So the decision to take those risks around drilling are going to be so much easier. Right. Okay. Let's move now on the partnership model, because for me, some, this is something that, to be fair, at least for me, something key in, in, in Aventra at this point. And, and I think one of the uh, strongest things that you have at this point is that kind of partnership that you have with all the partners of the joint venture. So I would like to, to understand or if you can talk about that, uh, that partnership work with the, within the joint venture and also how is the relationship with Sun and Gold specifically? Basically. Yeah, so I, I think, you know, having a partnership is a very normal. I've been in the industry almost 40 years now and pretty much every operation I've worked in, there's been a partnership. Uh, and those partnerships have um, contracts, they have agreements that really govern the partnership. So from a kind of legal formal point of view, this is a very well trodden. This is what we've been doing in the industry for 50, 60 years. We have something called a joint operating agreement and it sets out all the conditions and terms and how we work as a partnership. So, so the formal part of it and the legal part of it is for us very straightforward. It's, you know, those documents are very normal, very straightforward. I think when you jump to 305 and 305A and look at it as a, a this partnership, 305, 305A partnership, I think I'd make a couple of comments, right? I think prior to our involvement, you had quite a dominant operator at 50%. Uh, Sonigo, and you have then a myriad of small partners. So you have quite a complicated partnership that, you know, and the more people around the table, uh, you have one person dominant and then four or five other voices. And, you know, is that a great partnership structure to get things done? Um, hmm, maybe, maybe not, right? What's happened since us coming in is we've removed two of the partners, Ina and Azuli. So that simplified the partnership and we've consolidated. If you think today, we basically have, I'd make two things. One, 86% of the partnership is held by three parties, Sonigal, m and and Afentra. So therefore, it's a much more solid, stable partnership. And then within those three parties, there's not really one dominant partner because there's 36%, 30%, and 20%. So it's quite, so it's a kind of strong consolidated partnership, but the, those three partners, it's quite well balanced. And actually that results in that you really need to listen to each other and work collaboratively together. And and that, that was our whole intention. You know, that was when we looked at this asset at the beginning, we did not want a small minority interest and a complex partnership. And we spent right. two years restructuring that partnership with the support of Sonigal and M&P and others to a much better place. So that, that's kind of one really important thing about this partnership. I think the second important thing is you got to recognize that Sonigal is the national oil company of Angola. So it's, just, it's not just another commercial partner. Uh, it, it's an important national partner. And so therefore, how one engages and deals with Sonigo, and it's important to recognize their role and their place within the Angolan environment. And I think, again, you know, we talked about reputation and experience. I think the team, not, not just me, but the whole team, bring that experience of how to diplomatically work within a partnership that contains the National Oil Company and how we have to respect their position. But you know, we also need to get the job done and deliver the work, right? And and that that's that's a skill. I'd right. say that's a skill, and it's a skill I think that's held by the directors of Aventra. But more importantly, it's a skill that's held by the financial, commercial, and technical teams that work with the partnership on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, yeah, I, I think that makes sense. So, thank you, Paul. You have been speaking a lot, but it's not going to be like that. The rest of the interview so anastasia it's time for you now let's speak about the financials and the first question is very direct i would say so could you please explain how the cost pool works sure so the way it works and this is not just block 305 or block 305 8 it's a uh, concept which is uh, very well 
um, understood and implied in Angola is the cost pool is set up at the time when the exploration begins. So, for example, Block 305A has not produced yet. It's producing uh, some oil, but it has not produced tremendous amounts of oil yet. That block has a cost pool of $600 million. And the reason why it has a cost pool of $600 million is because over the years, uh, through time, there is a lot of expenditures that have been done on the block. Yes. So when that block enters commercial production, that pool will come into effect. So effectively, you will start utilizing it. Block 305 at present has something in the order of 400 million, again, over time, accumulated not utilized yet, but also annually we're adding about $300 million extra towards that cost pool. So that cost pool is not stagnant. It's, an, it's a pool of capital which varies up and down depending on your activity level, depending on oil price, and depending on a number of other variables. But that's the order of magnitude of what we currently have um, in the cost pools for the two blocks uh, where we have operations. And, and one question, like the different uh, partners that you have in the blog, they can have a different uh, amount of cost pool or is the same depending on the percentage? It's, it's JV, so every single partner yeah. has its own share. So, for example, we have 30% share in the yeah. cost pool right now. And the same would apply uh, for each other JV uh, participant. And the the kind of the the counting that follows it is done by the operator. So Sonangol, with every single lifting, will send an update to every single JV partner stating what their uh, allocation is and what the cost pool is. So everything is being documented very rigorously and being again equal between various JV partners. Okay, and in terms of the cost. Oh, um, how it goes into the balance sheet. So that will become a tax asset in the balance sheet or, or how it works? So it really isn't. The, the easiest way to think about it is think about our reserves. So our reserves are effectively our asset, but it's not recorded on the balance sheet. So you ultimately recognize reserves through the revenue attribution. So when reserves produced, they produce revenue and that's when it's recognized. The same thing with the cost pool, it's not a tax asset, it's just something that over time we recognize uh, as part of our revenue recognition. Okay, perfect. Let's move now in terms of hedging, okay, because it's something that, that people have been talking a lot. So what we would like to understand is like, what is your hedge strategy? Um, if you can go a bit on the technical side, why you are using puts, that is my understanding, instead of other financial products. Sure. So uh, we have a board, established board, uh, kind of approved strategy with regards to hedging. And um, the limits that we have is 50 to 70% for the following 12 months to be hedged. Uh, the board policy does not dictate the type of product. And I'll come to talk about why we used uh, puts as opposed to other products later on. Uh, and the following uh, subsequent 12 months, will have a limit of 30 to 50%. So that's the broadly defined strategy. Now, when it comes down to the execution, uh, we look at a variety of products. Um, so far, because we hedged very close to the time when the actual lifting occurred. So for example, the February lifting we hedged in December okay. and the June uh, lifting, which just occurred, we hedged in May. So we were very close to the time. Um, and again, the volatility right now in the markets is very low, low by the historic levels. And what that does is effectively the puts are now at a very cost, a very low cost relative right. to the historic periods. So what we have done, for example, with the June hedges is we secured them at a dollar. So it's a very small cost to buy yourself a protection. And we try to find the equilibrium between protecting the downside. Obviously, we still have an RBL to address. We want to yeah. make sure that we have the floor. So, and at the same time, we would like to allow our shareholders to enjoy the upsides to, you know, as much as we can. 
Obviously, with time, we will be layering in hedging for the balance of 2024 and also into 2025. And as you go out in time, of course, the put prices will increase. So what we will do is we will then look at the variety of products just to make sure that, again, we have this equilibrium. We're not speculating on oil prices. We're not trying to uh, predict future. But what we're trying to do is find this equilibrium of protecting the downside, again, making sure that, you know, the RBL is protected, our cash flow is protected, but also allowing within limit for an upside potential uh, from the assets. So again, it's it's an exercise that we will undertake over the coming weeks where we will be uh, executing more hedges uh, for the upcoming liftings uh, in August, upcoming lifting potentially towards year end but, and also into 2025. And, and just something that came to my mind at this point, what would be the right product theoretically, okay? But if there would be like a lot of volatility in terms of pricing, because I guess that the problem there is that the puts would be expensive. So maybe you need to look into other alternatives. So which ones could be, for example? So look, swaps is a good alternative, right? So you can do costless, uh, sorry, uh, you can do costless colors. So that's one option. Uh, you can do uh, premium callers, so you can, you, you can again look at the market and think about whether or not it's worth to buy a slightly higher ceiling. So if you are willing to spend, let's say, a dollar or two dollars to buy yourself a bit more room, you can potentially look into those alternatives. So that's probably where you will find us more often than not. So either in, in the put space, if it's near term uh, hedge or it will be in the costless or slightly slight premium uh, color option uh, for 2024-25 hedges. Okay, perfect. And one question that also came to my mind now is like between the retail investors, there is always uh, some kind of chat about the uh, palanca premium. Okay, so in terms of having like, let's say $1, $2 over brand price. so. Can you tell us if that is true? If you can tell us more or less how much is it? And also in terms of the lifting, uh, what kind of price do you use? Do you use an average, a monthly average, the price of that day when the lifting is happening? So any kind of color that you can provide? Sure. So on the uh, Brent Premium, uh, it's generally between a dollar to dollar fifty. So it depends on the market conditions at the time. So, but that's typically the range. Uh, really? For a full cargo, so full cargo is nine hundred and ninety-five thousand barrels. So full cargo, that's the range of premiums that we see in the market. Yeah. Uh, with regards to pricing, that varies. So market is generally in two categories. So you either get a month average pricing, or you get an average of five days pricing after your lifting. So depending on who your offtaker is, depending on. Um, sort of the timing of, of market, it's either one or the other. Uh, we yeah. do or have done uh, historic co-liftings with Morel and Prom. Again, in the webinar that Paul mentioned earlier, uh, we have a, a set of slides that uh, detail our hedging and, and lifting strategy. And there you will find the details of all the uh, cargoes that we have done with Morel and Prom going back to August of last year. So those were joint liftings. They went to various off-takers, so uh, it's in the market, So, and therefore the terms were slightly different. Um, yeah. And the same will apply going forward. So we have another joint lifting we have just done uh, with Morel and Prom in June, and the August lifting is going to be again done jointly. And again, depending on who the off-taker is, we will negotiate terms. So okay. it's either one or the other. Um, there is a lot of factors that um, impact that. And of course, we will try to also make sure that that lifting and the timing of pricing is joined up with our hedging strategy. Okay, and uh, let's move into capital markets. So can we also talk about your interactions with the capital markets and what are Aventra's options to access capital, basically? Sure. Look, the one thing that I guess led partially to our success is the fact that we actually haven't had to access capital markets to a large degree. 
um, outside of just a small debt package that we ultimately secured with Trafigura and Mauritius Commercial Bank. So we have not gone out and raised equity. So what we have operated so far is just on the basis of a balance sheet that we had on day one, which was about $40 million. Uh, that said, obviously, we're staying very close to both equity and debt uh, providers uh, on the institutional side. We have engaged in regular dialogues, and we strongly believe that when that next significant deal comes that does require equity financing, that there will be options available to us. Again, for that, the, for that reason, we're often engaging with the market, but we're not raising equity at this point. With regards to debt, we see that the market improved uh, since three years ago when we put our debt package in place. Again, at the time, uh, offtake financing was probably the only realistic option for us uh, to finance the assets. We ultimately went with Trafigura, which is um, a very successful partnership, we believe. Uh, Trafigura subsequently brought in Mauritius Commercial Bank uh, to support them. So these two companies are now lenders to us. But now there is a broader set of lenders, not just for the offtake financing, but also we see some commercial banks coming back. Uh, we see particularly strong interest in larger facilities. So if you are to look for a facility greater than $200 million, there is certainly a lot more appetite now for those sorts of facilities. And that's just going beyond sort of your traditional kind of Glencore and VTOL, BP and Shell and other household names. Perfect. And uh, do you believe that is the current market open to fund, fund uh, oil companies in Africa? Look, we do. We do. We, we get very uh, frequent inbounds from uh, people who would like to, again, establish uh, a dialogue with us early on and see what the potential uh, opportunities could be. And the reason why we think believe that there is a strong interest there's some of it is what you mentioned around uh, projects happening in the north sea so again there is a lot of people that are now leaving north sea for a variety of reasons ultimately yeah. capital has to go somewhere uh, mauritius commercial bank is, is a great example of that where they clearly see that there is an opening and opportunity as other banks retreated you know mauritius came in they are now working with a variety of providers, um, you know, of, with a variety of oil and gas companies across Africa, not just West Africa, also North Africa. Um, and, you know, the likes of uh, RMB, for example, is very active. NetBank is very active. And there will be a number of others that are very fluent in Africa. We understand the challenges. We understand the frameworks, but also they look at those tax reasons, for example, we discussed earlier, the cash flows that these companies generate. And, you know, they look at risk and rewards and they say, look, you know, it's it's actually a great place to do business. Uh, yes, we charge a little bit more because it's Africa. So you'll probably charge another 100, 200 basis points in addition to what you would charge for an OECD project. But it's a great place to do business. Okay. And, and the final one here. Is ESG an issue to, to find reasonable price funding? So for us, it hasn't been. Again, there will be certain banks that will just retreat from oil and gas altogether. So again, we're not talking about those. Uh, there will be a selection of banks where you have to meet certain very stringent criteria. For example, they will only finance gas projects. For example, again, we're not going to fall into those uh, kind of buckets because we are truly oil and gas. Yep. But for those who would like to see a very reputable company who follow the guidelines, who do all the right things, I think Aventra fits that block. And okay. we, again, with our, all the operational activities that Paul described, we're very focused on ensuring that we limit flaring. We're doing a lot of activities at the operational level. It's not just to put something on paper and then forget about it. Uh, we're actually doing uh, what we said we would do. And that's what's important to a lot of these lenders. They can see our progress. They can see what we deliver. And on that basis, they're comfortable with financing ourselves and others who are in that same category of responsible people who come to Africa to do great things in the oil and gas space, but also work within this just transition thing. Okay, perfect. So let's move now to start closing the interview uh, into M&A because... 
at the end, uh, the assets that you have are amazing. I completely agree. And there is a lot of run up uh, for those assets. The answer looks very, very exciting, but uh, people want more deals, you know, and it's never enough. So let's move into, into that. And Paul, what uh, I would like to understand better is like, what is a Fentrust M&A strategy for, let's say, the next 18 to 24 months? Yeah, I mean, it, again, back to the presentation we did on the 11th, I mean, really the final slide, or I think it was a penultimate, we, we laid out, we see three avenues of growth at Aventra. One we talked about already in this conversation uh, is the organic growth at the asset. I think the second one is us growing the business within Angola. And then the third one is outside Angola. So with regard to Angola, you can already see us growing the business kind of, let's say, organically through the onshore. Um, but we also see that there is potential to do more M&A within, within Angola. Um, so that, that's a focus. And I think being in country, you're more likely to be able to identify opportunities and then take a proactive approach to that opportunity. Whereas I'd say in the rest of West Africa, where you're not day to day in the countries, you're probably a little bit more reliant. I mean, we try and identify proactive opportunities and pursue them, but you're also a little bit more reactive. So people announce that they're going to sell something or you hear that somebody's planning to sell. So you react to that and, and then you go in and that's more likely to be competitive environment. Um, so that's, you know, where, as we, I think we said at the very beginning, you know, um, that hasn't changed, you know, over the last three years, we've probably looked at 30, 40 deals, you know, over the next three years, I'm hopeful we'll look at another 30, 40 deals, but we'll only execute if the deals kind of meet our commercial and technical and ESG criteria. And now that you are in Angola and people know the way that you work, are you actually receiving calls like, hey, maybe this would be interesting for you instead of like you calling people like, hey, are you selling this, that, or there's an opportunity here? Yeah, I, I think what, you know, I think the big difference of being in the country is in a country like Angola, you've got to believe that the past was the IOCs. The future should really be in local oil and gas companies. And let's say we're in the middle. Right. right, and and how did do, how does Angola transition from the IOCs to local oil and gas companies? And I think that's where Aventra can come in because we're sitting small enough, nimble enough to be able to engage and work with those local oil and gas companies and kind of help AMG AMPG with that transition over. So we're more likely to get calls from smaller oil and gas companies, local oil and gas companies who've maybe heard something that's happening and have some idea, but they can't, they don't have the capacity capability to do it on their own. So yeah. maybe they've heard of Fentras and country and they've looked us up and you've looked at our experience and said, would you guys be willing to work with us? And obviously I think that's good. As long as the counterparty is somebody we can work with, then I would argue that that's got a greater chance of success because if you were sitting, Alex, in ANPG or in the ministry and you were Angolan, I suspect you would prefer to see Angolan companies be successful in the m and market. You know, it yes. needs to be open, it needs to be commercial, but you would have that preference, right? So if somebody wanders along with this solution that says we've got a highly competent company matched up with a company of lesser experience who's local, who are going to work together to deliver opportunities and get deals done. That that sounds like quite an attractive formula. So I, I'd say that's the sort of environment we're in in Angola, uh, and that's the opportunity we have there, and, and we're well known, and we, we have a really strong network. Okay, perfect. Um, now for you, Anastasia. So what I would like to understand better is what is a, a Fentrust approach to deal making? Basically, what is for you value driven growth or if you are prioritizing value uh, over the growth or like having more barrels per day? Look, the key for us is to deliver 
shareholder value. We're not here to create a company of 60,000 barrels with a broken balance sheet. We're here to deliver value for shareholders. And we're also looking at every single deal from a prism of balance sheet and how much impact will that deal will have on balance sheet day one, but also day two, three, four, five, and six. As you have seen from the deals we've done so far, and again, uh, we wish we could replicate that and we will aim to replicate that. We can't guarantee that. Um, but as you look at the three deals we have done so far, the ultimate cash payment for the three deals combined was only in the order of $9 million. So for $9 million, we aggregated an asset base, which will produce $50 million a year for a number of years. Um, we have generated $67 million of asset cash flow last year. Those deals are hard to replicate, but that's, if you wish, you know, almost the golden standard, then that's what we aspire to do. Um, we also look at the balance of interest. So it's obviously important for us to achieve what's right for Fentra, but it's also very important to achieve what's right for the country and what's right for the seller. So we're not here to game the system or create a deal that will ultimately look bad on the seller because in the end, the seller is still to hand over the asset. And that's where the contingent elements come um, into the deal making. Again, we've seen a lot of these in the last few years as oil price volatility increased. There is a lot more contingent payments we're seeing. So the objective for us is to achieve this balance between the seller, the host country and Fentra. Do the right deal, the smart deal, a deal that will not put a strain on balance sheet, but ultimately a deal that will deliver uh, what our shareholders expect us to deliver, which is share price appreciation. And now turning back into the M&A market in general, into West Africa. So uh, I would like to know how it is at this point. Is it quite open? The brand price volatility is being an issue. The high brand prices like lately, for example, it's been an issue or how, how are things there? Look, I think it's always... Um, an interesting market to be in. And there is a reason why we're in this market is because we think we understand this market a lot more than some of our competition. I think what changed, the oil price in itself, of course, has impact, but oil price has been going up and down you know, all the time. So I've been okay. in the space for the best part of 25 years now. And it's only with the passage of time when people say, oh, that deal was really clever. How did you I do this deal now? This is with you know with passage of time there is no such time when in my living memory where you can say well this is the time to do deals and you can absolutely get it done at the right price saying and it will deliver four or five times shareholder return it just does not exist no matter what the oil price is um yeah so and we're very kind of uh, obviously careful with how we structure them as we discussed. So what has changed is what we discussed earlier in this conversation uh, is this drive towards improvement of terms, which actually makes deal making slightly more challenging because a number of those you know, established players in places like Angolium and that some years ago, before the new changes, they probably looked at their assets and they thought, well, I have only five years left on the license. It's kind of not great. Can I sell it? Who would buy it? The challenge then was there was no one to sell to because Aventra didn't exist. And there's a few others who could step in and take that position. Now, Aventra does exist, but what happened is the terms improved. License got extended, terms improved. The same companies look at their, you know, worldwide portfolios and they say you know what angola actually looks great so yes i can still you know go back and you know rethink and sell or i can wait right and i have time so and that doesn't worry us because we're not here for just the next 12 months or 24 months and if the deal doesn't happen you know we're out of existence we have a very strong balance sheet we have an organic growth strategy as paul described uh we're sitting in a good space we just need to be patient and do the right deals and wait for a number of different factors to align and to come together. And we're very play, very well placed for that. It just might take a little bit longer, but that that's not a concern. The biggest concern would be for us to do the wrong deal at the wrong pricing, and then right. have the, the kind of the unintended consequences of rushing just for the sake of doing a transaction, which we're not doing. And to be honest, you have done three deals and definitely none of them was the wrong deal at the wrong price. That is something that... 
already three out of three that you did and, and there were really good deals. So hopefully the fourth will be as good as the other three. This is all, all, all I can hope. <laughs> okay, so Paul, I would like to understand better, like what does Aventra see as its competitive heads, heads in Africa? Look, I, I think there's a number of ways to address that. I, I, I believe, I mean, that maybe one thing is less about Africa and just about the size of the company versus the experience of the team. So I, I would say that, you know, the pedigree of the team that came together um, to form a Fentra and drive it forward came from vehicles that were much larger and, and had track record of growing other companies. So I think what you have is so, sometimes when you look at very small cap companies, maybe there's yeah. some concern about the experience level of the executive team. Uh, and maybe this is their first run at some of these adventures, wherever. So I think that's a differentiator. I think you have a very highly experienced executive team and board in quite a small vehicle. Uh, yeah. And I think that should be an attraction to uh, shareholders and investors because it's much easier to make very significant value progress on small vehicles than it is on bigger vehicles if you've got the right team. So I think right. that's not an answer to the African point, but I think that's really important. When you then focus in on Africa, why, why do we have a competitive edge in Africa? Well, you know, we've got a lot of African experience. You know, personally, the last 20 years actually now, because I, I, I really kicked off work in Africa in detail in 2004, uh, when we did a big major corporate acquisition in my previous company. Um, so that's a lot of experience we've been, we've, we've worked and have kind of networks and reputation and probably pretty much every country from Mauritania down to, to Namibia. And we've been active in most of those countries. So that's yeah. really important, understanding the jurisdictions and understanding the difference between each jurisdiction is really important. But then I would say is that, you know, the investors tend to focus on the executive team. Actually, if we pick up some of the individual team within the company, they equally have very, very, very deep experience in West Africa. You know, our head of subsurface, Robin, you know, I'd imagine just about knows every asset in West Africa. He's been working it probably as long as I have been, but very focused on subsurface. So I think it's kind of that combination of experience, kind of reputation and network within the region. But then on the tech, you need to understand what a good technical asset is, because that's, that's where the value is initially created. And then as Anastasia just kind of described, having the experience of how do you structure the deal, the commercial aspects, the financial aspects, the debt aspects, the SBA aspects, and then how do you work the equity market, right? So, right, perfect. So I just think to the pause. perfect. Uh, final question for each of you. Uh, how often do you go to Angola? I now I'm probably up and down three, four times a year. Um, and uh, I, I think the the key really is, you know, whilst I'm there three, and it's a bit of a repeat of what I said before. It's actually, again, investors tend to focus in on the CEO, the executive team. What they should really focus in is the collective team, right? And our collective team, I mean, half of our collective team and are, are actually sitting in Luanda today, right? And they're down there and they're actually, there's kind of three little groups down there for different reasons, but they're yeah. all in Luanda engaging with uh, their counterparties and stakeholders down there. And that's important. So there's there's really two weeks goes past or three weeks goes past where there are not members of the Aventra team in Luanda uh, working face to face with our stakeholders and counterparties down there. When was the last time that you were there? Um, I, I'm probably about four weeks ago. Yeah. Somewhere. You were there too, Anastasia, or? No, it was the following week, I think, or the week before. Yeah, yeah. yeah just after. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that's the key, uh, Alex, is it's not about one, one, one person can't 
move very much on there. It's about the team, and uh, I think I can kind of um, underrepresent the importance of the combined team experience and team effort and flexibility. And I think we commented at the very beginning. You know, Anastasia is making a description about Aventra today, and we're saying it actually makes it fun. And I think it is. You know, I think the team are willing to be flexible and be travelling up and down to the land because they're enjoying what they do. They don't. They don't find it a burden. They they find it. You know, a, a kind of fun because they're engaged. They're part of the generation of the value that we're we're trying to create. Okay, perfect. And do you visit another uh, African countries? Um, I mean, certainly over the last three years, we've been in quite a few African countries. Um, you know, either about specific deals that we're trying to do or just re-engage with regulators or ministries or national oil companies. Um, so it, it's, I think it, it's a bit less necessary, you know, because, you know, three years ago, if you mention a venture to anyone, they go, a venture, I've never heard of that, right? It's a little bit right. different now. I mean, I think the brand, I think, you know, one thing we, we didn't talk about a little bit, you know, it, what surprised me is in three short years, Afentra has become a very well established brand in the region and in our industry and in the capital markets. And I think actually that in itself has been quite an achievement. Yeah, perfect. So that's it. Well, I, it was one hour, 20 minutes. I was expecting, I told Christine, 40 to one hour. So, you know, it was a bit more. But thank you very much both for your time. You know, that is always a pleasure. And, and Paul, you know that. We have been following the company for a long time. Actually, the first video that we did in Afentra uh, in Momentum, it was literally three years ago mm -hmm. when you didn't have any asset. You know, yeah. so uh, it's, it's definitely a success story for for Momentum. So thank you both for your for your time, and hopefully we will speak uh, again soon with more good news. Because lately, to be fair, we just get good news from your side. Yeah, well, well, we'll certainly very much appreciate your support and your investor support. I mean, that that's how we've got to where we are. Uh, we always kind of recognize the patience of, the, <coughs> excuse me, of some of our investors over the last three years. You know, yeah. I'm sure some of them at times wondered whether these deals were really going to complete. But yeah. uh, hopefully they feel their patience has been rewarded and we certainly we, we appreciate that that patience and support. And uh, yeah, we look forward to the next three years and, you know, rewarding shareholders again. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. And thank, thank you, Alex. Yep. Yeah. Thank, thank you. We'll speak again. Thank you. Oh,